Hi everyone, I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes for people to join uh, and I'll get, get going. So um, yeah, just a couple of minutes uh, and then we'll start. Okay, cool. Uh, well, I think we'll get going. So, hello. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope you've all recovered from the football enough uh, to listen to us talk about legacies and uh, data. Uh, we, uh, if you don't know Wood for Trees, we are a data and insight agency that work with charities in the UK and internationally. And we do a lot of work with legacy teams um, from building prediction models to right through to things like data selections. Uh, so uh, we wrote a paper about um, steps that we think uh, organisations can take to, to help use analysis and data to, to improve their legacy fundraising performance. And this is going to be, I guess, like the audio book version of that. Uh, my name's Andrew and I'm Director of, of Analysis here at Woodford Trees. Uh, and later on, you'll also hear from Georgina Hyman, who's one of the best sort of legacy fundraisers around. She is head of uh, legacy and in mem giving at Alzheimer's Research UK. Uh, she's grown their legacy program hugely in the last sort of five years. Uh, so the plan is to spend about sort of half an hour going through uh, some slides that we've prepared. Uh, we'll talk a bit about a recent project we did with uh, Alzheimer's Research as well. Um, and then we've got some time for a Q&A with George at the end. Um, I think a bit of housekeeping, there is a chat function, I think, in um, the whole GoTo webinar uh, setup. So if you've got any questions as you, we're going through or at the end, do put them in there. Uh, we'll try and get to some of those at the end. If we don't, we can always follow up uh, with, with you if you've asked a question separately. Um, uh yeah um, so i think that's that's sort of housekeeping and um, the sort of the plan so i will uh, crack on um at uh wood for trees uh this is what i've already said about at, yeah at wood for trees this is um uh we use uh data to improve uh fundraising performance and mostly that is around things like uh regular giving uh or cash appeals uh but really um legacy is no different um stewardship is really important um a lot of the same channels are used um the big difference though is that long-term payback period so from getting a pledge to actually when the income is realized that can be anything from 5 10 15 years uh, and that brings about different challenges it also uh, means that we um, really need to take a more longer term approach to sort of data collection, and data use, uh, and just using data in general. Uh, but if you can overcome that, the, the sort of the benefits and the opportunity that Legacy obviously presents is, is huge. So three billion pounds are left by people in their wills each year, um, and that's expected to grow nearly 20% uh, this year. Uh, and also we've got a, an aging population in the UK. Um, those baby boomers are reaching a point in life where legacies are, are coming into, into fruition. Um, and so a, a bit of a legacy boom is on the horizon. So uh, getting into a place to, to make the most of that um, is going to be really, really important. 
So how can data help? If you've ever been on a, a legacy presentation, you've probably seen this slide before. Uh, we're not the most imaginative bunch, but um, yeah, we think data can help. And um, there are lots of different ways uh, that we think. Um, as I said, we've sort of laid out five sort of steps uh, as a roadmap. Um, that organizations can take to, to use data to improve that legacy fundraising. Uh, the first thing is really just starting to understand what data you have. Uh, most charities will um, manage their legacy administration sort of outside of their CRM. Uh, things like first class, uh, very commonly used. Uh, things like spreadsheets, as much as um, they may, maybe shouldn't be used, do get used. So often there is data in different places. Um, so bringing that data together is really important. Uh, it's great that you can collect information and you're recording it, but unless it's combined, uh, it, it won't make it as valuable. If you can combine it and bring it together, um, well, that it will just give you a, a more a quicker way of using things and that more holistic view of what your legacy supporters are doing. Uh, being able to see that whole journey, that whole view of, uh, of what a supporter has done and what their legacy relationship has been like. Another really important thing with, um, with the actual data itself is that historical data is often more important than the most recent data. So knowing where a supporter lived, for example, when they pledged a legacy is more important than uh, perhaps knowing where they are right now. Um, so it's like difference to, to other types of fundraising, um, but that sort of historic accuracy of that data is, is really important. Um, typically, the first thing we do um, once we've had a good look at the data and we understand it is look at how the uh, program is performing and, and see what it can tell us about, um, about that and about the supporters. So we might map out something like this, which shows how many pledges each charity have, how many inquiries we've got, how many legators there are, uh, and where they're coming from and how they're moving through the different stages. Uh, so legators, for example, often is around 50% of them are completely unknown. Um, and that sort of 50% is a quite a good sort of uh, benchmark to think about. Of the 50% that are known, well, 25% often have pledged. And 25%, um, a quarter of those, again, are just um, are people that were donating to us, but never told us that they had intended to pledge uh, a legacy or leave a legacy. Um, and they're the sort of things that we'll look at as well as that journey through the different stages and where different supporters have, have come from. Um, here's an example of uh, some profiling um, that we might look at when uh, doing that initial understanding. So being able to understand the, as well as the volumes of supporters, also what they look like um, and how they're different. So here's an example of a charity which had pledges, intenders, inquirers, uh, free wills inquiries uh, and just a general support base. Uh, so using um, this is a ACORN, so that's a geodemographic uh, segmentation which takes someone's postcode and says well people in this postcode look like they're old or young or affluent or not. We can use that to say how different each of these groups are uh, and in this example the pledges and intenders were a fairly affluent group uh, but in comparison the free wills inquiry that they were getting were less affluent. So we could start to understand that although they had a big group of legacy supporters, uh, they were different. Uh, and that was very much led by how they were being recruited. And it's those sorts of things which help us understand those legacy auditors, understand how the channels and the, the mechanisms that they're using to recruit people um, can lead to different profiles and different types of audiences within uh, the program. And the better you understand um, your audiences, then the more uh, effective your marketing will be. Uh, I think this was a really good uh, piece of um, work from Greenpeace. Uh, I don't know if it was last year or a couple of years ago, um, but really matching their audience understanding with the delivery mechanism they used. So a direct mail piece, um, which appealed to the older audiences, but with the language uh, that a Greenpeace supporter would engage with. Uh, 
so once you've understood the data that you have, you can start making use of it on a regular basis. Um, the start of starting point for that is with regular reporting and getting that reporting right will help you monitor the health of your program. Uh, that could be as simple as just monitoring the volume of supporters you have, the number of pledges you have, the number of inquirers, uh, right through to looking at conversion rates between um, statuses or average legacy values. The key thing is really to set those KPIs that make most sense to you and your program. So if you don't do um, legacy appeals, then don't set uh, a campaign response rate as a KPI. Um, if your activity is all about growing your inquirer plot, well, that should be um, the main thing that you're measuring. So again, it's not about this is what this is what you should uh, have. There are a number of things, but pick the ones that that make most sense to you. Uh, having said that, here are some sort of underused KPIs. For, sort of in my opinion, that um, should be looked at more often. So the first one being the realization rate of um, pledges through to leaving a legacy. And that can be a really good indicator of things like the quality of the stewardship that's being undertaken or the type of donors that are being recruited as pledges. Uh, so if you're seeing that um, rate drop or increase, it could be a, a, a good sign or a bad sign. Um, and even if it's none of those things, even if it's other factors, um, it will also help when thinking about um, future income and um, and what the what the likely cash flow of those pledges is going to be if that that rate is starting to to drop. Links to the forecasting, which we'll come on to later in this in this in this talk. Uh, conversion rate, um, so similar to realization rate, but earlier in the relationship. So, uh, how are people progressing from inquirer to pledger and things like that? And Again, it can be a good indicator of uh, the quality of those inquiries and likely future value. Um, and typically that tends to be quite quite small. Um, we don't often see sort of all inquirers suddenly become pledges, but it can still be uh, give some good clues as to what's going on. We did a piece of work um, with a charity that did a lot of um, uh, telemarketing inquiry recruitment, as well as their sort of off, um, uh, sort of mailing and inserts and warm mail type um, uh, inquirer pledger recruitment. We found that the the inquirers from the phones were not converting through to pledges anywhere near at the rate of others. Um, they looked like a very different audience, a much less engaged audience, um, and therefore they were treated with a, a, a much a much more a cautious approach as to whether they were genuine inquirers. And that can help be a good indicator of that. And the final one on this list, as digital becomes sort of ever more important, um, particularly with the sort of the shift to more online uh, use as a result of the pandemic, um, being able to track how people are viewing your uh, legacy page online, how many people are doing that, um, whether they have come where they've come from um, and how they interact with that page how long they stay on it things like that i think will become more important to sort of manage um uh yeah to manage and to, to have a view of uh whatever you choose though the easier the reporting is to uh, understand the better so making it clear and easy to understand will make it accessible uh, and then more used um uh, and consistency is also really important. So whatever KPIs are used, uh, make sure they are well documented. Uh, then that will stop them being questioned or contradicted. Um, something we we get uh, a lot of with when we're building reports um, uh, and dashboards, making sure that those definitions are well 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 known and well understood. So that if if that definition can be used across the whole charity, then you won't get conflicting numbers and, and people will engage and believe and, and use that report a lot more a lot more regularly and just finally on reporting something i don't think legacy teams sort of get access to enough of is other sort of fundraising reports um so being able to see how other uh, areas of fundraising are are doing 
but that will have an impact on uh, on the legacy program. So the bottom point there. So what channels are being used to recruit new donors? And do you have access to? Can you see that if um, your charity is shifting all of its spend into virtual events and it's going back into face to face now? Well, what does that mean for um, legacy uh, recruitment? Um, there's no way your your appeals can perform at the same level if the audience has changed. If it's a much younger audience, does it mean you have to shift away from pledging pledger recruitment to inquirer recruitment and start that journey a bit earlier? If the the dynamic of the supporters that are being brought in are different, or does it mean you have to do more cold activity? Um, similarly, with uh, cash appeal performance and open rates. So if other teams and other areas are seeing that supporters are becoming more or less DM responsive, well, what does that mean uh, for you? If people are engaging with email, does that mean you should be doing more by email as well? So I think asking for access to those sort of other fundraising reports and being able to see them, I think that's, um, and again, another sort of under underused area or a underused thing for our, by legacy teams or something which um, they, they aren't given as much access to as, as perhaps I think they, they should be. So if you've got your data sorted and you can report on what you're doing, the next thing you might want to do is use data to predict uh, future behaviours. Uh, in our experience, the most effective technique uh, to make use of in this area is propensity modelling um, for ready for the recruitment of new uh, pledges and, and new inquirers. Um, it can be used to identify uh, those people most likely to respond uh, when asking them to engage in a legacy relationship. Uh, a propensity model is really just a, a statistical scorecard uh, that is used to predict um, supporter behaviour. Uh, and it uses all, whatever data you have on your CRM about those people. So that could be what they've done in the past, where they've donated to you in the past, what you've sent to them uh, previously, uh, where they live, um, what their age is, all those things that we know and have recorded about a supporter. Um, two, broadly, there's two options then um, to, to build, or two ways to build a model. Um, Typically, uh, we would use the results of a previous mailing um, to develop a statistical model using uh, regression analysis uh, to estimate how likely people are to respond uh, again. So what, what the process does is uh, if you took uh, your legacy pledger mailing and uh, say it went to 50,000 people and you've got 100 people that responded, you can look at the characteristics of that 100 people and look at how they differed to the people that didn't respond. And what the modeling process does is look for the characteristics that are most important. So what are the, what are the things that are most different about the people that responded to the people that didn't respond? And then once it's done that, um, a model can be built and then applied to other people that haven't been mailed before to find people that look similar to the responders uh, and less similar to the non-responders. And it's not uh, as quite uh, a yes, no, it's not a, these, these are people that will respond, these are people that won't. It's more of a, a scale as uh, so people get scored, uh, but the people with a higher score being more responsive and the people with a lower score being less responsive. So then you can use it to say, uh, we want to, we can already predict roughly how they're likely to respond. And so this is how many we want to go to. Uh, an alternative approach to that, so if you don't, the, 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 down, the, the, uh, the thing that that process doesn't allow is if you don't do big mailings like that, if you don't have that information to model, uh, then that isn't going to be an option. So an alternative approach is to build a more of a profile based model. So again, using similar techniques, but looking at all the pledges that you have uh, at the moment on uh, on your supporter base and seeing how they're different to the rest of the supporter base. Now that's not specific to a, uh, a type of approach, uh, so uh, it wouldn't be specific to a direct mail or specific to a telephone appeal, um, which could be a weakness, but it would give you a more rounded view of uh, what a supporter, uh, a legacy supporter might look like uh, and therefore be able to build that that view uh, of who they are. And this is a typical output. 
So I mentioned before about looking for characteristics that are different. Well, in this example, these, there's a few that might come out. So uh, use the bottom one there, total value in this in this model. That was seen as a, uh, a big predictor of who would respond to a, a legacy approach. And if uh, someone had given a lot in the past, well, they were going to be more responsive. Uh, and they're the sort of things um, that the modeling looks for and then applies a score to so that it can be used to, to sort all supporters on the base. Uh, this slide is to remind me to um, talk about that it's really important to think about who you're modeling as well. Uh, so whether it's uh, inquirers that you want to target or pledges, uh, or if it's legacy supporters as a whole, but to really understand if there are differences there. Um, so if we uh, take uh, these two as an example, if I wanted to find more um, uh, Arnold Schwarzeneggers, then I would want to look for people with that characteristic. Um, same with uh, Danny DeVito. But if I combined them as a as a single group, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't find anyone that looked like either of these two people. So if we think of Arnie as our pledges and Danny DeVito as our inquirers, combining them wouldn't give us the right sort of person to look for. Really, we'd want to look model each of them separately because then we'd find we get a much more accurate prediction, accurate representation of who these people are uh, and how these people work. So setting that up in advance, making sure you understand how these people are different and whether you can combine them uh, and how it fits with the program as well is, is really important. Um, so just a quick checklist uh, for how um, to, to consider when building a model do you have the data and do you understand its contact context? Um, in that example I said about before, if you've got a lot of telemarketing inquiries, do you want to model them? Are they the sort of people you want to find more of or should they be excluded from any sort of modeling process? Uh, has your activity been broad enough to be able to differentiate supporters or do you have uh, the campaigns to allow that? How the, How's the model going to be used? Uh, so if it's going to be used for uh, direct mail appeals, well then have you got enough people that responded to direct mail in the past to model? Uh, if they're all um, telemarketing uh, recruits or uh, organic recruits, they might not be, you might not be modeling um, channel responsive people uh, in such a way, so the model might not be as good. Um, and the final point is, uh, can can you tell what the supporter looked like at point of pledge? And that's really important. So again, thinking back to that historical data point, do we know what that person looked like when they pledged? Because that's the information that we we need. We need to know um, what someone looked like when they made that action, rather than what they look like now. Um, and that's yeah, and that's really important. We've had a, a few examples with with charities where they sort of overwrite um, relationships. So if someone moves from inquirer to pledger, they lose all that inquiry information. So we don't know what they look like at a point of inquiry, or simply that um, dates aren't recorded when someone pledges. Uh, so again, we don't know um, what how many gifts they've given at that point because we don't know when to to count them up until. Uh, so things like that again are really important from a data point of view. Uh, for getting those those data sets right and that data collection right so that it enables things like this to be easier and more possible in the future. Uh, okay, so moving on to uh, support journeys. So more and more uh, fundraisers talk about support journeys. I'm not sure there is such a thing, uh, but I do believe in uh, communication journeys. And I think legacy journeys should be uh, and stewardship should be no different. Um, you can plan communications to look for triggers to improve uh, relationships with legacy supporters. Uh, so things like supporters updating their uh, addresses, for example. Um, all those could factor into more triggered um, stewardship programs. Um, legacy supporters also are the most, or typically are the most engaged supporter group. Um, so having those 
tailored journeys, tailored comms plans for those um, sports, I think is really important. One of the things I um, hate to see is when someone becomes a legacy and then they suddenly get excluded from cash appeals and raffle appeals and all the things that they're used to getting because they said they wanted some information about a legacy, they they suddenly stop getting their their normal relationship. So I think um, using um, more data to uh, tailor those comms and uh, tailor those journeys to a supporter, I think in that um, legacy environment as well as other fundraising areas, I think is going to be and is more important. And the technology is there to do it um, and it's to make those sort of journeys possible and in reality um, and other teams of the areas are doing it. So. Uh, so why shouldn't uh, legacy stewardship and uh, legacy recruitment be more like that? Uh, a few things to consider here. Uh, different types of recruits will probably need a different type of journey. Uh, so DM responsive supporters, email responsive supporters. So if you're getting digital recruits versus um, cold mail recruits, they might prefer different types of comms. You might not have uh, ways of contacting them by some channels. So they'll want to have different journeys. And then over time, they should be able to, um, they should be able to uh, move between them depending on how they're responding. So if they're not responding to email, even if they were a digital recruit, you might want to try them with um, direct mail and things like that. And as we talked about, um, looking for triggers um, for the timing of those appeals. So it could be updating their address. It could be reaching different age bands or um, certain geodemographic groups, if that's something you have access to. Um, and also what looking at what time works best for your cause. It doesn't have to be Free Wills Month where you do all that activity. Some people, for some support groups, it might be January when it works that legacy messaging works best for others it could be the summer holidays so being able to segment in such a way that picks that out uh, i think that um that's the sort of thing where journeys and that trigger comms um can all help with and all help test as well it's only by trying those different times that you'll learn what works best for different supporter groups okay the final thing that we think data uh, has a key role in is with legacy forecasting. Uh, and by that, I don't mean the sort of overall, um, that three billion figure that legacy foresight do a lot of. Uh, we're talking about for your charity and your program, what, how many pledges are you going to have that are in next year? And what does that mean in terms of income over the next five, 10 years? I think that's really important for um, for business cases for more investment in legacy fundraising. If you can show that uh, your program is going to raise a million pounds uh, next year uh, and it can raise five million pounds in 10 years, if you get this many more pledges, I think it can really help secure more uh, investment for legacy activity and really highlight the importance of it. Um, it's not easy though. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, when it comes to legacy uh, sort of forecasting, you've got to consider your sort of current pledges, so how many you have at the moment, um, but also where are your new pledges coming from? So are you going to have, um, is there a pipeline there? Or actually, as we touched on earlier, if you've suddenly switched to um, virtual events and face-to-face, -face, well, that pipeline's really going to slow down. So the number of pledges and then the number of legacies off the back of that is going to be a lot longer. So I think it's important, it's with all of that recruitment, it's not to say these people will never ever leave a legacy. It's just going to take an awful lot longer for those younger people to, to be at that stage. Um, using information about the number of unknown uh, legators and uh, pledges that don't result in a legacy. So that's sort of 50% of unknowns, factoring that into your income forecast. Uh, and also that realisation rate, that 80, 70% bringing that down um, and also understanding what the value of those legacies might be so are they going up or down um, uh, and being able to track that and then factor that in I think becomes sort of really important too. Um, one of the the key things then that makes um, those these forecasts work so uh, well 
is life expectancy data. Uh, and often you have to make assumptions around the people that you don't have age for, that they have a similar profile to those that you do. But if you do that, you can then use the uh, life expectancy data to understand when those legacies might be realised. Um, here's an example of how it works. So this is all uh, open source. This is data that the ONS produce and publish. And it says, so based on how old you are now, um, this is how long you've got left to live. A very cheery, uh, cheery slide. Um, so, and what is good about it as well is rather than just saying, oh, life expectancy of someone at the moment is 80 years, it will say if you reach a certain point, this is how long we, you're expected to live. So, if you're lucky enough to reach 100, uh, the life expectancy data says we've probably still got another couple of years left in you if you're well enough to, to get to that point. So, it's quite a nice um, data set to use for, for predicting those um, those uh, points of uh, points in time when people will, will will leave a legacy, and this is then what you'd hope to get from it. So this is then um, an income chart which shows legacy income rising over time, and how much of it comes from uh, your original pledge pleasure pool, and how much uh, comes from uh, non pledgers or, or people brand new to you. Uh, you can then discount that based on uh inflation and things like that but this is the sort of thing that would then allow you to go and say well this is where we could get to this is what our based on our size of our current pledger pool this is the income that we're going to get over the next five ten years and actually if it starts dropping off it's a point to say well in 10 years because of the recruitment you're doing we start to lose income uh, and i think that can be really powerful Cool. So, uh, just there are sort of the, the steps then that we we think are really important. I'm just going to quickly talk through some work we did with Alzheimer's Research UK um, project that we did with Georgina, um, and we followed this, uh, a similar process really to two of those stages. So Alzheimer's um, were quite keen on the model, uh, but we began the work by doing some insight into um, what the program looked like. Um, and just understanding the context of it so that any model that was built was appropriate and targeted the right people. Um, it was a really good project. So the Alzheimer's Research uh, UK had grown their, their legacy programme, the number of legacy uh, sports hugely over the last sort of 10 years. Uh, I think it uh, quadrupled in size over the last sort of 10 years. Um, the profiles of the supporters were quite typical. So for the pledges, tended to be older, tended to be um, uh, quite affluent, um, the sort of things, quite engaged, the sort of things you would expect. But then there were other groups where they've been doing activity around free wills that were less engaged. So that chart on the top right shows um, the effectively the people that also were donating, um, and, but um, so the grey being sort of non-donors, the other colours being where they've done one, two, three, four, five other things. Um, so that point about could we model all these groups together or could we consider all leg people with a legacy relationship as the same or were there differences within them that uh, was really important to consider uh, so that was something which we made note of we took that through to then uh, to then build a model to find more pledges um, uh, well actually we combined uh, pledges and inquiries because they had a very similar profile so could we find more people of uh, that would that would um, inquire or pledge um, a legacy uh, to the charity? Uh, we split the model into two: um, people that had donated before and people that hadn't, uh, because again they had different characteristics. Uh, but went through that same regression uh, approach uh, to find, uh, based on what we knew about them. What their profile looked like, how that profile differed to the people that hadn't pledged or hadn't inquired before, um, and built the models uh, that reflected those characteristics, and then created um, on the left there you can see a gains chart that's called. Um, so the grey line being if you didn't have a model and you just randomly pick people, if you pick 50% of the people, you find its nature of being random, find 50% of the, the pledges. But if you use the model and the characteristics it suggested, well, if you um, took the top 50% in the model, you'd find 80% of your of your pledges from that group. So that gave us confidence in the, in the models and how they would be used. Um, and 
but the idea was that based on that growth that you'd seen how can that they now had enough uh people they had a good amount of uh supporters that had those relationships that could be used to understand who they were and how they differed to the people that didn't have it and how could they use that now that data that that rich information to to go and find more supporters uh of that of, of a similar nature so i'm going to stop sharing this screen and i'm going to introduce george to you all and just ask her a few questions about the project, which hopefully you'll find interesting. So, hello, George. Hi. How are you doing? I'm okay, thanks. How are you? Good. Um, thank you for yeah for chatting to us. Uh, can you tell us, I guess, a little bit about the program and what you do at uh, Alzheimer's Research UK? Then. Yeah, of course. So our program, um, as you said, has. Uh, well, not only has drupled in size over the last couple of years, but our program has as well. Um, so we've been focusing over the last previous three years, up until about two years ago, on cold recruitment, focusing on digital acquisition and um, free wills network events and recruitment. Um, and then we um worked on a strategy to really try and understand our warm donors and who to talk to and how to recruit them and inspire them to want to leave a gift in the world to the organization so since then we've been focusing on internal engagement working with teams across the organization um, and helping them to talk to and build relationships with supporters around legacy giving and the the, the benefits to them and the organization in the future and on the back of that developing appropriate hacks to help support them in that decision making process uh, and has that been hard has that been difficult or are people sort of buying into that <laughs> <laughs> um do you know it's it's a challenge because obviously there's a lot of other things going on and everybody has their own priorities and all those teams are about cash today really aren't they so it, it has been a challenge however um the organization has been fully on board we have as one of our organizational priorities legacy giving on that across the board so that's coming as a director from our senior leadership team and um, which is fantastic so uh that's been really helpful i think Sadly, COVID times really, when a lot of the relationship fundraising just wasn't able to happen, um, mm -hmm. our legacy pipeline was super strong, so that really helped us out, and that really helped enforce just why legacies and DM are so important to organisations because they're the they're the um, long term sustainable. Some might say boring, others might say not. I would be in the not category um, area of fundraising that really, you know, it helps to underpin everything that you do. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point about cash today versus that long term sustainable. It's so important, isn't it? Well, it's the biggest um, which, challenge uh, that we all face, isn't it? Like every charity faces that. Like we want money in today, but we also need to think about the future. So how do we balance that? And it's about yeah. trying to get the right balance, recognizing that, you know, God forbid we have to go through another COVID type situation. And um, how are we going to ensure that we're set for that? And we were incredibly fortunate with how our organizations run and how we focused on certain areas um, that we were able to get get through it, you know, with relative ease. Um, but yeah. I think it highlights just how important those areas are. Yeah, definitely. And I guess um, next question is going to be about why you did the project. So as we saw a touch of there, it's very important to have a legacy pipeline. Was that the sort of the main driver for, for wanting to do it? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I, I believe that data should underpin all of our fundraising. I think it has the ability to range from relationship fundraising through to legacy fundraising um, and for me there was there's been I've been at AIUK now for five years and it's been in the works we need to get a better understanding of our data we need to we need to and then something else has come up and we need to focus on that first um, so my team has been fantastic at working with the data tree team to try
try and A, tidy up the data and B, try and understand what it's telling us, but there's only so far that we could go. And it finally got to the point where we had a bit of space, <laughs> um, albeit it was quite squished, I know, I'm sorry. Um, but we had a bit of capacity, we had a bit of space, and we had a little bit of money. So we were just wanting to jump on that opportunity and just go for it. Um, and I complete, I, I, I looked through the presentation again last night and um, I'm so pleased that we did it. It just, it helped to really highlight the areas that we, the things that we knew. So it helped to form co greater confidence within our data team that they were doing the things and providing the information that we were kind of after and that they were, they were sourcing. But it also helped to identify new, new bits that um, will really help us develop our marketing program specifically. Great. Yeah, I always sort of undervalue how important that is when you've got hunches or when you think you know, you sort of know what you're going to see, but then to see it in figures and to see the actual numbers behind that, that can be really sort of important too and valuable as well. Yeah. I can't wait. So we, um, before we got the model, we did our last DM cross-sell and we used the recency frequency value normal um, formula to do our selection. And um, now we've got the model and it's been loaded into our data warehouse and such like what the data team are going to be doing is they're going to be overlaying what this, what the propensity model would have um, highlighted as the audience to go to versus what we actually went to and we're going to see like how similar or how far apart they are so i can't give you any answers yet. Yeah, great. Fingers, crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed i would imagine it will be um i think there's going to be some interesting gaps to be honest with you um and i'm really partly really hoping for that because our results weren't necessarily as strong as i would have liked them to be so yeah. um I'm, I'm sure that had we have used the propensity model, we'd be in a different situation. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm sure it will. Um, uh, and talking about the data, were there any sort of barriers with them to to this approach or to using data in this way, or were they quite engaged and no, sort of so they were it? super engaged. I think the challenge that they had really was um, obviously we're going. I mean, AI UK has been going through a significant amount of change and progression over the last few years and the data team is one of those teams that no one really thinks about actually having to be the first one that's stepping forward and being ready for everybody else to like go nuts with their areas so they've been playing catch up and setting up data warehousing and um all sorts of things that i don't really understand um so the biggest challenge that we had was trying to find capacity for support from them so that not only were they involved in the project, because obviously we want them to own it going forward. So they, I mean, they're the holders of our data. So the data team should always be involved and engaged in all of these kind of projects. But um, yeah, it was just trying to find capacity and that, that support that was needed really. Great. Um, and for you, Joel, what were the sort of key insights that you got from the piece of work? So we haven't done lifetime value before. Um, it's a piece of work that is all that is on our, you know, across the organization list of things that needs to get done. Individual areas will have their own lifetime value, but it hasn't all been pulled together. So for me, I found that absolutely fascinating. I really liked seeing our pie, so our pledger and tender inquirers versus the rest of the donor base. So um, I found that really interesting. And actually that's leading on to conversations that I've been having internally about doing a proper LTV piece of work so we can break it down and actually see what areas are really delivering longer term income and what areas are delivering really good income for now, but long term not. So what do we need to do about that? Um, and then the other um, piece that I really found fascinating was the geographical overlay. So we haven't had the capacity to do that and our data team haven't had the capacity to do that so to be able to see how our pie audience um 
matches or in our case doesn't match the rest of the donor base is really interesting um and those pockets are really helpful to see that there's actually some significant differences and we need to look at you know whether it's our recruitment or how we're driving our legacy audience or if we need to like, refocus where we would normally do some of our acquisition activity yeah yeah i think that's definitely and i think like um with that geo demographic stuff it's really if you're paying for that as a product the charity have it you may you, you want to make the best use of it so um yes yeah, so that's, that's that's really good um i guess the last question then for me is what do you think sort of the challenges are facing sort of legacy teams and uh, this million dollar question isn't it but what do you think are the big challenges and how can sort of this sort of this is other insight sort of help them um, so I think the, the, the challenges that we've been facing are pretty much the same as what we've seen over the last few years, an increasingly more competitive marketplace and actually post-COVID, or I call this post-COVID, I know it's middle COVID, but you know, it's wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> but, um, it's becoming more and more competitive. So what's that going to mean going forward with all of our marketing programs? And actually, that's where the data element comes through really strongly. So it's for, for me, when I'm looking at our five year plans and looking at our data side and actually going, we need to be more data driven with both our um, acquisition and engagement. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so we get the best uh, return on our investment. Um, then obviously, the other challenge is cash today versus cash in the future and um, that's always going to be a massive challenge uh, for legacy fundraisers and organizations but i think in a post-covid world where we've seen like relationship fundraising take a real hit because it hasn't been possible to do i think that's going to cause a significant challenge potentially in next year's planning for organizations because how do they how do they continue to invest in legacies if they also need to get more cash in today to ensure that they're around for those legacies to come through? Mm. Um, and yeah, I think you know we, we, we've got quite a few challenges, but those are the two biggest ones that I would I would highlight at the moment. Great, yeah, not going to be easy, but like you said, if you can, well, I think you're in a fortune to have created that pipeline. Um, and to have that that evidence that the investment does work and it does sort of um... and that's the most important thing because if mm. you don't have any evidence and you're not showing any changes then why is anyone going to further invest in your program um so as you can tell like i'm i'm pretty dm with my approach mm. it is data driven it is evidence-based and we have some crazy formulas to work out the potential return on investment on all of our activity that we do. And that's how we've been able to get case, you know, put submit cases to SLT in order to get increased investment, which mm. we have seen pretty much year on year over the last five years that I've been there. Great. Cool. Um, we've had a few questions, but I think they're mainly data ones. So I think you're safe, uh, George. Uh, I'll just go through them. Uh, first one uh, from Jack. I uh, said about why that historic address, uh, historic data is, is perhaps more important than uh, the most recent um, address data. Um, the thinking there is that often with the legacy uh, campaigns, um, pledge responses, you don't get huge numbers. So you might have to combine the last maybe three years worth of, of campaigns uh, and that information. And if you're looking at the appeal, which, which was three years ago, and you're looking at the pledges that pledged at that point, you don't want to know where they live now, you want to know where they lived at that point of pledge. So what did they look like at that point of time? So being able to have that historic record of where they lived so that you can model what they look like when they pledge, because that's again what you're trying to do now. Um, that's why that's sort of important. Um, a couple from uh, Dave. Um, so the forecasting, yeah, there's a discounting line. Um, so that was to account for, you're, we're using things like, well, this is currently what their 
um, the legacy value is, so that might be an average value of £15,000. But in five years' time, £15,000 isn't going to be worth £15,000. It's probably worth £10,000 so with inflation and things. So that's why that having that discounting line um, can be important. It's something you may or may not want to consider, but it could, it could be something to put in. And yeah, using uh, a measure like inflation uh, to do that um, uh, can help you get there. Um, have we ever modeled legators? Uh, it's not something I've done. Um, I think other people I'm sure have, but it's often difficult. As I said, not there's never huge volumes that go through that process. And because it takes such a long time, say 10 years for them to become legators, having that, that data recorded on the CRM um, to, as to what they've done and historically where they've been, um makes that really difficult or certainly in our experience makes that really difficult or really limiting it might be something which becomes more common over the next few years um because data collection has been better um more recently um and as those people then start to leave legacies it might represent more data but historically it's not been an easy thing to do and, and not something we've done a lot of um and again, this one I might throw to you, George. For a legacy report, um, how often would you want to see it refresh? I'd assume daily refreshes aren't very important. You don't need it that real time. How often would you be looking at a, a legacy report um, and, and wanting to see sort of updated numbers of pledges and things? Is that a monthly thing? So I like it monthly, yeah. So I've got a dashboard that's been set up. Um, that monitors all the change on a monthly basis um and you know it's it's important for me because we've got we obviously go through peaks and troughs of activity so when we're going through quite a lot of activity it's nice to see what numbers are increasing and where they're increasing um yeah but in terms of um, other side of reporting, so the age analysis and the ACORN banding and such like, I don't need that refreshed on a monthly basis. For me, that's quarterly to every six months. Great. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I know we've had one specifically for you. Uh, is there anything uh, you, in particular, you wish you'd been recording or doing differently sort of five, ten years ago that sort of you wish you'd sort of asked everyone to, to a question or um, that you think would, would help you today? Yes. So I think, um, so before five years ago, there wasn't a lot of legacy marketing that took place, but what there was, you wouldn't really know about it from the database. So it would be really nice if um, there was some kind of tracking of what people have been asked when um, back then, including things like, you know, if they'd responded because of a case study in a newsletter and they ticked that appropriate box, you know, um, just understanding the sources and the communications that these reporters have had really helps to build a much more thorough picture of what communications they're receiving and what's working and what isn't working. Um, so yeah, just and just you know the data. That's what we all wish for, though, isn't it? We all look yeah. back, and probably five years ago, we were saying, "I wish five years ago we had seen the data in this." Yeah. <laughs> well, I wish we'd done that. I wish we'd done that. Yeah. 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 Um, um, no, that, but yeah, uh, it's just that we all have to deal with, and it's not the end of the world. It's just it just means that my poor team have to jump through hoops when we're putting stuff on the database because we really want to make sure that there's enough data going on that we can then properly analyze it in a few years time and it's not just left for a you know that internal memory oh don't forget we did do this special communication at this time of year yeah but you're the only person that knows about it or, or the person yeah. who knows about it left two years ago yeah exactly gone <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that, that, I guess that is a big challenge with, with data, isn't it? It's 
how can you you need to record things in so often you can't record everything but if you can record things that are important in a consistent way then that's only going to add value in in three five years time exactly but it's across the organization it's not just for empathy mm. no. so we need to be able to see what our journeys are what our communications are that we're taking that we're you know, a taking our supporters on and how they're responding to them because how do we know if um something has worked or hasn't worked if it hasn't been consistently captured on the database yeah exactly there's only so much you can do you can you can make your bit great but if the other teams or the other areas aren't recording things as well or as consistently then things start to fall down so yeah, yeah it's a it's a broader challenge than just that for legacy teams but i think everyone's got a little a little part to play in it oh definitely cool I think that's a good a good note to finish on. Well, thank you very much again, George, uh, for joining us, and um, thank you for everyone on the call. Um, hope it was useful, uh, and yeah, hope to see you all again or speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>